Hi, my name is Sergio Farragut. I'm a developer advocate here at Imply. Um, and in this short video, I'm going to talk about the Apache Druid real-time ingestion. Um, we're going to take an in-depth look at how it works and uh, how it uses resources. So first, uh, you know, at the high level, at the ecosystem level, uh, one thing to understand is that uh, uh, Druid's real-time ingestion is parallel from end to end. So this starts all the way at the producers, where uh, the message producers, these are, you know, mobile phones or devices that generate messages and publish messages to a Kafka topic in very high numbers by nature, right? So they're highly parallel. They're each independently generating messages and submitting them to um, a streaming engine. Um, we're showing Kafka here, it could be Kinesis, and they use very similar concepts to, to enable parallelism and, and scalability. In the case of Kafka, it separates topics into multiple partitions, and uh, partitions are managed by multiple broker nodes. Um, so this gives Kafka scalability to manage large topics that have, or large uh, throughput numbers. In a similar fashion, uh, Apache Druid uses many ingestion tasks to consume uh, data from Kafka. And the way it works is uh, the parallel ta each task is assigned uh, some subset of partitions uh, from a Kafka topic. And uh, each one in parallel and independently uh, consumes from uh, these partitions um, and ingests data into Druid. So the ingestion portion is uh, parallelized in this way uh, with a maximum level of parallelism in Druid equivalent to the number of partitions in Kafka. So you can, if you need more throughput and uh, you're increasing the number of partitions in Kafka, you can do the same in Druid and increase the number of tasks to increase throughput. Um, but typically, uh, the number of tasks aren't necessarily the number of partitions. They're, they can be less, and subsets of the partitions will be assigned to each task for consumption. Uh, Druid ingests the data, and while it's ingesting the data, <clears throat> it processes queries in parallel. So when a query arrives at Druid that involves the real-time portion of the data, uh, the subquery is submitted to each of those uh, ingestion tasks that has a portion of that uh, real-time data to resolve the that, those portions of the query in parallel and return them to the broker. Um, so the par parallelization goes from production of messages all the way through the pipe, the, the, the messaging uh, engine, the streaming engine, and uh, through the ingestion task all the way to the query. And that's how end-to-end -end this whole uh, infrastructure is parallelized. Now let's take a look at individual tasks, right? So, so I'm going to start uh, dissecting the, the different elements of uh, an individual task and what it's doing inside um, inside those tasks. Um, so each task or each uh, P on JVM, if you're familiar with that terminology, um, has multiple threads. Uh, the first thread that we're discussing here is the consumption thread. Um, this thread is in charge of connecting to the uh, Kafka partitions it's been assigned. <clears throat> it uh, reads messages from those uh, partitions and, uh, and loads them into an in-memory buffer called the receiving queue. Now, notice here as we talk through these slides that uh, we're color coding the different kinds of memory that are required uh, or that are used by each of the ingestion tasks. Uh, we're using orange for the heap, so the receiving queue is in the heap. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see uh, uses of direct memory and local storage in, as, as we move forward. So from the receiving queue, the uh, messages are parsed. So the messages could come in multiple different formats. So the first thing that happens is they're parsed into internal record form, um, and they are applied to a logical segment buffer. So these three square cubes here that we show with dotted lines uh, represent uh, each a logical segment buffer. So if you're using segment granularity of one hour, you would see something like this, you know, the, the whole timestamp, but the, the timestamp plus uh, the hour from zero to one, hour from one to two, hour from two to three. Or if you're using daily, you would see ranges of days in, in, these, um, in these segment buffers. Um, so these are uh, also in memory, in heap structures that, uh, that, drew it, that the consumption task is managing. Well, the consumption thread is managing. Um, and uh, as it appends rows into it, it's also applying uh, roll-up. But it does so as it's ingesting them into these buffers in memory. Uh, you can see uh, the real-time segments by querying the uh, sys uh, server segments uh, table, the system table uh, within Druid. 
uh, to see <clears throat> which real-time se segments exist and are being managed currently by active tasks. Uh, one thing to note here is that uh, while there may be multiple buffers because you know data is arriving over a span of time, um, having very late messages means that the, the, the span of buffers that, that we need here are a lot more. Right? The, the late arriving uh, messages will create older buffers as, when they, whenever they arrive and therefore require more buffers uh, at this stage. So consumption is going on and uh, <clears throat> the, there are a few thresholds that, uh, that make the in-memory buffers persist to disk. Three different uh, thresholds that can occur. Uh, the first one is the max rows in memory. So the total count of rows across those uh, logical segment buffers uh, if that reaches uh, this threshold, then all of those buffers are um, pushed onto the persist thread, which begins a, the persist process. That also happens if you hit a threshold of max bytes in memory. We keep a total count of how many bytes uh, these rows are occupying uh, over the whole set of buffers. So when the persist occurs, the, the set of buffers that we were consuming to are, are pushed into the persist state and new buffers are created for any messages that continue to arrive. Um, so the consumption continues in the consumption thread uh, while the persist thread takes that set of buffers and uh, converts them uh, into a, the Druid segment format. So it columnarizes it, it creates the indexes for them, and puts them into the segment format. There could be many uh, individual intermediate persists uh, for segments that correspond to the same uh, time interval because these are, uh, for each of the buffers uh, for a given time interval, these persists occur. And uh, so you could end up with a set of, uh, of intermediate persist files for each of the logical segments. Uh, these files are stored in the base directory for the task that's defined by the druid.indexer.task.basedir uh, parameter. Notice here that we've started using local storage. So in their color coding, the, the Druid segment, the intermediate uh, segment files are stored locally <clears throat> within the uh, task subfold. Consumption uh, continues, the persists continue, so there's multiple intermediate persists, and we start counting the total number of rows that have been uh, persisted by logical segment for, let's say, this, this example of the uh, one to two hour um, logical segment. So if that threshold occurs, or if the max total rows, so across all tasks, uh, the max total rows has occurred, um, or a certain amount of time uh, managed by the intermediate handoff period is also a trigger of, of a merge, or, or the, the end of the task, the, the task duration, which we'll talk about separately. Um, so this initiates the merge operation. This is a, also a different thread uh, that's executing the merge. Uh, this uh, operation will take all of the intermediate persist files and combine them into a, a final, merge them into a final segment to be published and, and do the publishing of that segment. Um, during this process, uh, one of the things that uh, consumes or can consume a significant amount of direct memory is the column merge operation. So it'll take uh, all of the intermediate persists. Um, so each column within multiple intermediate persists are merged together into one final column, including you know their, the merging of their dictionaries, the merging of their indexes, and the mer merging of their data, such, such that we end up with a single uh, segment for all of the intermediate persists that uh, had occurred up to that point. Uh, that final um, Merge segment is published to deep storage and a handoff uh, process occurs, right? We're, we're keeping this data around here and still responding to queries until a historical has taken that, uh, that segment and can now uh, respond to queries directly. So that's the ingestion side. Uh, before we start talking about the query side, uh, let's step back out of a, of a single task and remember that uh, when a query comes in to the broker, and it requires uh, any of the logical segments that are being ingested, it, it's going to talk to all the tasks that uh, have that potentially have a portion of this data. So for a given uh, streaming ingestion task, uh, streaming ingestion job that has multiple tasks, uh, the broker would submit th that same subquery to all of the uh, tasks that are uh, ingesting data for that job. Within each uh, task, the, the subquery that arrives, it arrives first through the uh, JETI thread or the JETI uh, thread pool, uh, which is controlled by the HTTP num threads parameter within the, uh, within the task. 
so that gives you the maximum number of requests that a given task can process at a time. Typically, the, the, the number is a little higher uh, than the total sum of the number of connections that uh, the brokers can do. So each broker can uh, initiate uh, a, a parameter called num connections uh, to uh, each of the running tasks. So we need to have enough uh, HTTP threads to address them, plus a few more for internal communications. From there, these tasks are assigned to, uh, or these subqueries arrive to a particular H HTTP thread. Each of those HTTP threads takes turns at uh, using the processing threads that uh, actually execute the, uh, the query logic and, and process the uh, intermediate files uh, or and the uh, in-memory buffers to respond to a query. Um, before we go into how the query works, uh, let's take a look at a few parameters here, right? Uh, at the top, we see the uh, top right, we see the Druid processing num threads that controls the number of processing threads that uh, exist within the task. Typically for each uh, ingestion task, this is two, but it is a tunable parameter. <laughs> Uh, also, the um, it, within each of these uh, processing buffers, uh, they'll take the uh, query from from the HTTP thread uh, and <clears throat> identify the the list of segments, uh, the list of uh, logical segments that they need to process, and access the uh, uh, in-memory buffers, both those that are in the consumption thread being ingested into the ones that have are maybe in the middle of an intermediate persist. Um, but are still in the buffer, and all of the intermediate persists <clears throat> that have completed locally. So it reads all of those, whether in segment format or in in-memory buffers, and processes the query across all those uh, all those subsets of data. Uh, in order to do so, it uses a processing buffer. So each processing thread has a processing buffer that's stored in heap uh, that has the size of the Druid processing buffer size parameter, uh, buffer size bytes parameter. Um, so that's another source of uh, memory uh, utilization when processing queries. So if you have more uh, processing threads, uh, you'll need to have more processing buffers. Uh, another set of buffers that are used uh, specifically for group by queries are the merge buffers. Now, these are, uh, in this diagram, they're a little outside of the processing threads because it's a shared resource. The number of merge buffers available within the task um, is usually two. Uh, this is the minimum required to process uh, certain uh, group buys uh, that have nested group by logic. So, so there's a, a need for these two buffers. For each query, we'll need the, these two buffers. So uh, they're shared across the uh, processing threads. Um, and if you only have two of them, that means that uh, you will only be able to process one uh, nested group by at a time. Um, so this, you know, if you would have a need for more concurrency um, in group by queries um, because it's not keeping up, uh, one possibility is to increase the uh, number merge buffers yeah, in the uh, task configuration. So that's uh, the uh, query side of it. Now let's go back out to, to, the, to the job and talk about the uh, checkpoint and publishing. So we mentioned before that at task duration, um, the, each of the tasks will uh, do a final merge of the intermediate persist and, and do the publish uh, to deep storage. Now, um, this occurs across all ingestion tasks when uh, the job reaches task duration. This is something that may actually change uh, in future releases of Druid, for, but for now, this is the way it behaves. Uh, in the future, it may be a staggered uh, termination, but for now, uh, all ingestion tasks uh, complete at the same time. They all um, do the final merge and publish uh, to to deep storage. But in order to do so, the sequence of events is this. Uh, all of the tasks are asked to stop consuming, so, so they're asked to, to pause, and the tasks uh, pause, they do their, their uh, final intermediate persist, and uh, they go into a publishing uh, state. So the existing task move into a publishing state and a new set of uh, ingestion tasks are created with a new set, uh, which uses a new set of worker slots uh, in the indexers and middle managers. Um, so in the, current, in the way it currently works, you do need um, twice uh, the number of worker slots available in the indexers and middle managers whenever this transition occurs. 
all right, because the, the new ingestion tasks are created, they start uh, uh, consuming from where the previous ones left off, and they continue the normal operation we've been talking about, while the publishing tasks are all doing that final merge of, uh, of the intermediate persist and, uh, and publishing to deep storage. During this time, if queries arrive, both the publishing tasks that still have not uh, done their handoff uh, to deep storage and to the historicals continue to respond to queries as well as the new ingestion tasks that are now consuming uh, or continuing to consume from the uh, streaming engine. The publishing tasks build their segments and publish them to deep storage. Uh, once they are in deep storage, the, um, the coordinator recognizes these new segments that have been published. It asks the uh, historicals to load them uh, based on uh, whatever balancing strategy is configured for your cluster. And once a historical uh, receives uh, these uh, published segments, they communicate back to the publishing task that they, ha they have completed that handoff. At that point, and only at that point, is the publishing task uh, completed and, and terminated. There is a uh, timeout parameter uh, associated to that wait period. So it, they can be made to, to terminate uh, even before receiving the handoff, but that's uh, not a normal operation. And the streaming uh, goes back to normal, right? After the publishing tasks have terminated, now we are again at the, at the state where everything is just continuing to consume and, and uh, produce the, uh, and do the internal work that we described in the previous slides. So everything goes back to normal and ingestion continues um, ongoing. So anyway, that's what I had for you. I uh, hope you enjoyed that uh, short uh, explanation. Uh, give us some comments in the, uh, in the comments below and we'll have a conversation about it. Thank you.